Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel on Decolonizing Columbus, Transatlantic Perspectives on Statues and Anniversaries. Today's panel is one of the events that the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies has planned to mark Indigenous Peoples Day. Yesterday, Darlene St. Clair gave a moving and illuminating walking tour of Bedote, and later this week, on October 15th, Sisu Kaduta will be giving a talk on Dakota language revitalization, which you are invited to register for if you have not already done so. Today's panel is co-sponsored by the Departments of American Indian Studies, History, Sociology, and Global Studies, and we thank them for their supports. Our conversation today is, of course, taking place virtually through Zoom, um, but we are all also physical beings located somewhere. Um, so I will begin with a land acknowledgement specific to the University of Minnesota, but you are invited to uh, silently acknowledge your own physical presence and the land, land upon which you are located. Um, this acknowledgement is adopted, uh, adapted from the statements that was developed by the Department of American Indian Studies, one of the co-sponsors of today's events. Um, and I would also encourage anyone who um, has the time to go to their website to read through their entire statements. The University of Minnesota stands on Minnesota Makoche, the homelands of the Dakota Oyate. The river that winds through campus links us to the sacred sites of the Dakota people's origin at Pedote, where the Minnesota River joins the Mississippi. We call upon our neighbors in Minnesota Makoche to reflect upon the way these rivers form watersheds that link the university to native nations throughout North America. And as these river jo rivers join with the oceans, they link the university to indigenous peoples, nations, and communities around the world. Our three presentations today seek to decolonize Christopher Columbus from different perspectives. They consider the meaning and memory of Columbus within three very different imperial, linguistic, and ethnic contexts. And this is, of course, an especially poignant time to be having this conversation. Um, in the last months, we've witnessed that several statues of Columbus have been toppled, including one uh, here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Gabriela Spears Rico will be reflecting on that particular moment, seeing the Columbus statue in front of the Minnesota State Capitol fall to the ground, and what it meant to her as an indigenous scholar, mother, and artist. In other parts of the United States and elsewhere across the Atlantic world, debates have raged about the memory of Columbus and specifically about the statues erected to honor him. In their presentation, Laura Ruberto and Joseph Sciorra will look at the historical context within which many of these statues are created um, and consider what they have meant to Italian American immigrants. And of course, it is not only in the United States that Columbus is a controversial figure. Alejandro Baer's presentation will consider the debates about the memory of Columbus within Spain, showing how it has impacted controversies surrounding Spanish national identity, including Catalan separatism, the belated reckoning with the crimes of Francoism, and the neo-nationalist resurgence. Throughout these presentations, I invite each of those who are listening to think about the title of this panel and what it means to decolonize Columbus. And with that, I will introduce our first presenter and turn things over to her. Dr. Gabriela Spears Rico is a cultural anthropologist and an assistant professor of Chicano Latino Studies and American Indian Studies here at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She is from the Pirinda com community of Charo, Michoacan, Mexico, and also a Pore Pacha descendant. Her scholarly work examines representations of indigeneity in Mexican popular culture, and her first book is entitled Mestizo Melancholia and the Legacy of Conquest in Michoacan. She is a Mellon Mays Fellow and a Woodrow Wilson Fellow and serves as the chair of the Women's Indigenous and Native, Native Caucus for Malx, Mujeres Activas in Letras y Cambio Social, and as incoming chair of the Abyayala Working Group for NISA, the Native American Indig Indigenous Studies Association. Welcome, Dr. Spears Rico. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Baid um, and the Center for Holocaust and Indigen and for Holocaust and Genocide Studies for inviting me to be part of today's panel. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. 
Hindi. Na Chuskuya. Hello. Good evening from Imishashkadan, Minnesota, Makoshe. The place of white sandstone and the land where the waters reflect the clouds. I come from Michoacan, Purepecherio, the land of the fishermen, and I'm from the Pirinda community of Chato, Michoacan, in West Central Mexico, and also a Purepecha descendant from my matrilineal side. In the indigenous tradition of placing ourselves as scholars in a human journey, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking on stolen Dakota land and by framing my current work as a scholar within my human journey as a Pirinda and Purepecha person navigating this current moment in the Gregorian year of 2020, 920 years since my Pirinda people have been documented as living in Mexico, 720 years after Purepechas arrived in Michoacan, 565 years after my community was established, and 528 years after the Columbus landed in the Caribbean. My indigenous name, Erandi, means sunrise and was given to me as a baptismal name by my Pirinda grandfather, Pedro Yepes Chora, when I was a few months old. Shortly after my birth in 1980, my mother Irene left Michoacan for the United States to work as a farm worker in order to sustain our household and my grandparents raised me during the first formative years of my life. My tata Jose Rico was a campesino, a respected farmer in our community who knew and taught others how to plant and harvest a milpa to grow the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. He was a milpero. Tata Jose grew these vegetables to sustain our family and our community and also harvested maguey to ferment for pulque. He was also a pulquero. My grandmother, Nana Senorina, 11 years his senior, was a revered practicing medicine woman, a curandera who was hired to cure spiritual illnesses and to pray for people's causes and desires. The milpa was my first school and my grandparents were my first teachers. I was immersed in indigenous ontologies early on and understood that even though we lived in an adobe jacal and were among the poorest families in our village, we were incredibly rich in indigenous knowledge. I was a curious child and my grandparents were used to tending to many of my questions. I asked my grandparents questions about where we came from and who we were. My Tata Jose told me that we came from the corn and would return to the corn. To him, it was the milpa that was sacred because the milpa sustained us and maize itself sustained most Mexicans. I asked my grandfather why our last name Rico, a surname which I would later learn is Italian, meant rich when we were actually poor. He responded that he didn't know where we got our last name and laughed at the irony I identified. My grandfather also shared stories of oppression. He told me about the injustices he faced in the United States when he temporarily joined the workforce here, picking cotton in California as a bracero. He told me that his grandfathers had shared stories about a time when encomenderos owned our labor. My grandfather assumed that our last name had probably been passed down by an encomendero since all he knew was the milpa and that his grandfather spoke purepecha. My paternal grandfather, Pedro, occasionally visited us to tell me stories. Though my grandfather was a proud indígena, he had experienced a great, a great amount of racism just for being from where he was, Charo, an indigenous community surrounded by mestiza, mestizo, ejidos, and towns. To outsiders, Chato is a racialized space, and we were used to hearing the slur Charillo and Charilla growing up. My Tata Pedro knew that I too would experience the stigma of being from our community. And so he filled my early memories with stories of our community's glories, which included the fact that we housed an old Matlatzinca dictionary and once served as the meeting grounds for Miguel Hidalgo and Jose Maria Morelos during Mexico's War for Independence. Purépechas are politically visible and powerful in Michoacán because Purépechas have fought all territorial infringements dating back to pre-colonial times. My Tata Jose's people are known for having been the only indigenous empire in Mexico to have fended off Aztec infringements. The Purépecha language is completely unrelated to Nahuatl or any other language in Mexico, boasting more than 100,000 speakers. Purépechas continue to wage war as our ancestors did. To this day, communities like Chiran have involved, have, are involved in active armed resistance to affirm Purépecha autonomy and protect the community's boundaries from, from infringements. Matlatzincas, on the other hand, have suffered great cultural, spiritual, and linguistic losses 
While Purépecha is protected as by annexing the chattel settlement into their empire as an isolated community and one of the few remaining in our ethnic group, we have lost much of our culture to colonization. While Purépechas have always included Pirindas in their kinship and diplomatic ties, Pirindas were actually considered extinct by the Michoacan state government when our language became endangered in the 1930s. It was actually the Purépecha uprising of 2011 in the village of Chiran, which finally led the Michoacan state government to recognize all of Michoacan's indigenous communities, including Pirindas, in, in 2014. So even though Chato pre-exists the Spanish conquest, we are again real Indians, according to the, to the state, as of 2014. I share this testimonial to situate myself in this conversation as an indigenous person, now an indigenous migrant who knows both loss and resilience, and as an indigenous mother who with my Ojibwe Dakota partner must piece and weave it all together for our six-year-old daughter. My mother brought me to the United States when I, was, when I began my K through 12 schooling at the age of six through migrant education. I was so confused by the abrupt changes in my life and the complete difference in information about who I was as I was taught by American teachers. Though Mexico was hardly mentioned, I relearned what it meant to be indigenous when we recited that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Though there was no mention of my two warrior nations, I learned that we were conquered subjects who had rightfully lost everything to make room for the new and improved governments established by the likes of the Spanish in Mexico and the British in the United States. Growing up in California, I learned that all the unthinkable atrocities that happened to California Indians, including their enslavement, which went on well into the 20th century, was okay. I grew up angry and confused at learning these truths that conflicted with my grandparents' teachings but I also became determined and hungry for justice as I crafted a path for myself to become an educator through ethnic studies. Today, indigenous people still endure the historical trauma that I have detailed here as it has applied to me and my family. The legacy of colonialism, <coughs> sorry. The legacy of colonialism sparked by that fateful October day in 1492 still impacts us every day. In indigenous communities, we have our own version of the talk that we have with our children. <clears throat> it's the same talk that my grandfather Pedro gave me about why some people would hate me and humiliate me just for being from where we're from. The talk we have with our children unfortunately begins with explaining who Columbus was. My husband and I did our best to immerse our daughter, Miskozi, in her Ojibwe, Dakota, Pirinda, and Purepecha cultures early on to give her precious knowledge and ground her in Medewin ceremonial ways so that can under, she can understand her roles and responsibilities as an Ojibwe woman. We, ha we have been building her indigeneity up as much as possible since her toddler years to prepare her for the day when we would have this talk on why many of our people don't speak the languages we have been introducing her to and why we don't live the way we used to as she's heard in winter storytelling or, or has seen in books and films. The talk we have with our indigenous children involves telling them how we lost knowledge bit by bit. We have to explain epistemicide, the epistemic breaks that impacted our humanity 528 years ago to five and six year old children crafting their identities in a world that is completely different from the ancestral world that indigenous parents try so hard to expose our children to. Indigenous children don't have the privilege of not knowing who Christopher Columbus is because his landing is a moment that became definitive to, to who American Indigenous people are in the world. We have to explain these moments of loss, even as our children learn to say the most beautiful words in the world, I am Pirinda or I am Ojibwe, and even as my child learns to sing a song about her Ojibwe name. The talk takes years to detail linguistic laws, depletion of cultural and spiritual knowledge that must be pieced together with the help of Pan-Indianism. It includes the Spanish conquest, the massacre of Mexicas at El Templo Mayor, the persecution of Tangashoan, Erendira's stand against conquistadores, the forced removal of my daughters, the Cota grandmother from the very land she now calls home, and pinpoint the fact that her Ojibwe and Dakota great-grandparents were boarding school survivors, and that this is the reason why grandma doesn't speak her language. Finally, because we have a daughter, when she is an adolescent going through puberty, we will have to revisit this talk through a gendered perspective to explain the stark statistics that Indigenous women face in the United States. We will have to tell her that Indigenous women experience rape and assault at higher rates than any other ethnic group of women in the United States, and that the perpetrators are most likely to be non-Indigenous men. 
She will have to understand how colonialism also impacts her chances as an indigenous woman. She will have to learn how to survive as indigenous in a world that is now apocalyptic to who we were and, <clears throat> and are trying to be as a people, resilient. And in the midst of all this, we will have to explain why we still deal with visceral violent images that are explicitly racist against American Indians, such as dehumanizing sports mascots that recall bounty hunting and scalping Native people as sport, and yes, why we have monuments to Christopher Columbus. It was these feelings of exhaustion and these motivations as an indigenous mother that led me to heed the call to support the removal of the Columbus statue in St. Paul where I currently reside with my family on June 10th. And that warm, clear summer day, I arrived at about 5, 12 p.m. after the statue had already been taken down by protesters under the leadership of Mike Forsha, a leader of AIM Twin Cities, who over the years has been close to our family and has collaborated with our organization, First Nations United. When I arrived, I saw American Indian people and allies celebrating, holding each other and stamping on Columbus's head. I am an anthropologist who uses performance studies lens to understand the actions of the marginalized and racialized. Though I was there as an indigenous mother first, my anthropological perspective recalled that performance studies theories articulated by Diana Taylor and Dean McCannell, who insist that all performance practices by the racialized are embodied and that people whose ancestors have experienced violence carry the impacts of history within their bodies. As I witnessed folks celebrating and purging their anger and frustration upon the statue, I knew that this was an embodied performance of indigenous pain. In this way, we were our own view version of monuments, but once with tears falling and blood pumping through our veins. My, or, my own first feeling was one of joy. Upon seeing Columbus's face finally facing down the ground, his nose was directly touching the concrete and I appreciated his head's positioning as an offer of humility and human connection with the earth that he lacked in life. After taking a few pictures of this image that I wanted to remember, I approached Mike Forsha who offered me a piece of the rope that took down the statue, the statue to take home. I held the rope between my hands, feeling the intertwinedness of its fibers thinking of the fact that the fibers had no way of knowing that this would be their purpose when the rope was manufactured. My eyes welled up with emotion holding this rope as the drums began pounding and the singers wailed out a victory song. I knew that I was witnessing the end to a historic battle launched by American Indians, Black people, white and Asian American allies and Latinos who were present a moment that made sense in the sequencing of events that the unrest, after the unrest that overtook the Twin Cities since George Floyd's killing on Memorial Day. I was present to support the Kota and Ojibwe people to whom I feel a great sense of responsibility as I make a life here in their traditional homelands. But I was also there as a Pirinda migrant. a diasporic indigenous person who has her own feelings of contention to the statue. And so along with our allies, I took my place in the circle to participate in a victory dance and release some of our anguish that the, the monument had been causing me personally as I process what it means to raise my daughter with the existence of this monument on her Dakota homelands. Those of us who don't see our histories reflected in monuments also carry memory within our bodies. For racial minorities and indigenous populations, this typically means offering a counter narrative to these monuments that begins with our collective historical grief. The removal of these monuments provides opportunities to intervene in the national narrative, a narrative that was cemented yesterday by President Trump, who called the people upset at Columbus radicals who don't really see Columbus's glory. With the physical action of taking down the monuments, protesters who I'm calling historical curanderos reveal what was always there for communities with counter narratives, namely the pain and trauma experienced by the ancestors who endured injustices at the hands of the men being memorialized. This pain is brought into the open with the act of removal and the conversation shifts from one of upholding these men as heroic to one of questioning their roles in history. In this way, removal can function as what Aurora Levens Morales calls an act of historical curanderismo. The American Indian community had been asking for this Columbus statue in St. Paul to be taken down for years, and yet we're told to await a process that never actually resulted in a public conversation or in its removal. <clears throat> 
As a Mexican Indian, I have also been protesting the presence of a Columbus statue on Paseo de la Reforma in Mexico City, a removal that finally took place on Saturday morning ahead of protesters threatening to take it down. When I learned of the presence of, the, of a Columbus statue in St. Paul, the fact that I can't seem to escape monuments honoring this man no matter where I move disturbed me. As my fellow indigenous scholars and activists th throughout the country in unison will point out, Columbus is not only responsible for starting the transatlantic slave trade, but also the international trafficking of indigenous women and children who were taken to places like Spain and Italy to become slaves. For further reading on that, in archival evidence, see Andres Resendez's historiography called The Other Slavery. This history hurts. This is a legacy that we can't escape. If we are going to talk about reconciliation, like what is currently taking place in national conversations in Mexico, as we approach the 500th anniversary of the pillaging of Tenochtitlan, we, must, we need truth telling, like these brave acts of historical curanderismo. We need more than land acknowledgments and apologies. We need land back, resources to prevent our, to preserve our culture, investment in the well-being of our indigenous children. We need justice. Thank you so much, Dr. Spears Rico. Our next presentation is uh, a dual presentation between um, Dr. Laura Ruberto and Joseph Sciorra. Dr. Laura Ruberto is a humanities professor at Berkeley City College. Her research and writing focus on Italian and Italian American film, material culture, and cultural theories of transnational migration. She is the author of Gramsci, Migration, and the Representation of Women's Work in Italy and the U.S., as well as se several co-edited books and journals. She is a 2020 Mellon, Fellow, uh, Mellon Foundation ACLS Faculty Fellow and is currently a visiting scholar in Italian studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Joseph Sciorra is Director of Academic and Cultural Programs at the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute, Queens College, City University of New York. As a folklorist, he has conducted ethnographic research on vernacular express expressivity and published on religious practices, material culture, and popular music. He is the author of, among other things, Memorial Wall Arts and Built with Faith, Italian American Imag Imagination and Catholic Material Culture in New York City, which won the Italian American Studies Association's 2016 Nonfiction Book Award. Uh, please take it away. Hi, hi everyone, and thank you um, so much. Joseph and I are both honored to be here today and to participate in this very relevant conversation. And we have a prepared talk that we'll be splitting the presentation of. Uh, before we begin though, we wanted to clarify that we try and position ourselves and our research about Columbus within larger political practices. We recognize the histories of indigenous communities who were forcibly removed from the Ohlone and Lenape land that Joseph and I are respectively speaking from today on opposing coasts. And we're cautiously hopeful that educational practices such as this one can support continuing the colonial struggles. Good evening, everyone. In response to the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Black Lives Matter de demonstrators have taken to the streets in the United States and throughout the world, marching against police brutality and systemic racism. Participants in the ever-expanding movement have quickly turned their attention to public statues and monuments of historical figures who have been denounced for some time now as symbols of colonialism and slavery. At the fore of these vilified personages is Christopher Columbus, memorialized in statuary throughout the United States. Cast and carved sculptures of the 15th century Genovese navigator and colonizer have been decapitated in Boston and set aflame and tossed into the lake in Richmond. Across the country, munis municipalities have hauled away figures in order to prevent them from being toppled. The vast majority of these Columbus statues and monuments were created by Italian American communities and gifted to municipalities throughout the 20th century. As scholars of Italian American expressive culture and history, our interests in material culture, public space, and the construction of collective identities have been deeply intertwined in many of the global realities of 2020. We have asked ourselves, 
How does the ongoing and complicated history of Italian Americans memorialization of Columbus fit into contemporary decoloni decolonizing efforts? We have to date published three works on the sometimes contradictory relationship between the mytho historic figure of Columbus and Italian immigrants and their descendants, especially around the issue of public statuary and monuments. And it is from that research we speak today on this ever evolving topic. The 2020 removal of Columbus statues across the country is part of a decades long struggle around public symbols of colonial oppression and racist violence. Italian Americans have many competing perspectives about it. Their reactions to and their involvement in this year's protests illustrate the diversity of Italian American identities. For some, Columbus's image has come to symbolize the genocidal violence by which Europeans colonized the Americas. Especially in the last months, we have observed Italian Americans, often from a younger generation, campaigning in the streets and on social media for the removal of Columbus monuments. These activists are working to decouple Columbus's toxic legacy from the history of working class Italian American immigrants. For others, Columbus represents the legacy of historic xenophobia against Italian Americans that made achieving the so-called American dream all the more challenging for their descendants. For these folks, activism comes in the shape of vehemently supporting for the right to honor Columbus and keep their statues. Others still argue for a space in between these two positions by relocating statues, adding interpretive documentation, or otherwise negotiating with the competing values and histories around Columbus. In one of our studies, we focused on two 2017 cases of contest contested Columbus statues, Manhattan's Monument in Columbus Circle and a smaller statue in San Jose City Hall. Rather than rehearse the details of these events here today, we instead turn to a more general interest in better understanding how contemporary Italian Americans use memory and history as rhetorical strategies to defend or decry monuments of the past in light of mounting criticism against them in the present. In our longer work, we ground our discussion through Pierre Nora's notion of rememoration, whereby Columbus monuments have long become sites of memory for Italian Americans. An oft-repeated truism claims that Italian immigrants discovered Columbus in the United States, an American mythic hero whose hagiographic narrative was first crafted in the country's earliest days. The feminine figure of Columbia, seen here in this um, John Gass painting, developed during the Revolutionary War as a personification of the emerging nation, would and which would resurface in innumerable ways over the centuries, one only think of Columbia University. Throughout the late 18th and early 19th century, Columbus was a useful symbol of the country's territorial expansion westward which, grounded in the racial superiority and settler ideology of manifest destiny, resulted in genocidal acts of war, forced resettlement, and severe Christian conversion directed against indigenous peoples. In turn, statues, monuments, and other large-scale objects were crafted to glorify the positive attributes uh, ascribed to the mythic uh, Columbus. The U.S. Capitol became a major site for government-sponsored depictions of Columbus, further wedding the national imaginary with the myth. The 1893 World's Columbian Fair in Chicago, a culturally and socially influential enterprise marking the 400th anniversary of Columbus's landing, elevated the national hero worship to a massive scale. Italian immigrants arrived into this national fervor in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and saw in Columbus a way to deflect the onslaught of xenophobic and racial prejudice and the violence that they encountered. encountered. The work of symbolically linking Italian Americans with Columbus was not a mass effort rising from the bottom up but in fact the project of a small group of economic, political, and cultural immigrant elites. These prominenti, that is the prominent ones, situated themselves as the liaison between, between the undereducated working poor and Italian government officials and US elites, but in reality, they were mostly concerned with their own welfare and public image. <clears throat> 
Two immigrant prominenti stand out regarding the early Columbus Italian American Union. Newspaper owners, owners Carlo Barsotti, who was responsible for the 1892 monument in, in New York City, and Angelo Noce, who in 1907 advocated successfully for the country's first recognition of Columbus Day in Colorado. One of the prominentes motives for promoting Columbus as an ethnic sig signal symbol was to forge a national Italian identity in the diaspora for the vast majority of Italian immigrants who had left in Italy that, home, that had only just formed as a nation state a few decades earlier and for which most Italian immigrants had little firm relationship to. Columbus became a key symbol, as historia, P, historian Peter Vellin notes, of, quote, an imagined Italian heritage of civilization and whiteness, end of quote. Barsotti was a particularly problematic figure in his time. He became New York City's richest Italian by profiting off of working class Italian immigrants whose self-aggrandizing drive to construct the monument was strongly denounced by his immigrant cohorts as another form of exploitation and profiteering. This historical fact has all but been erased from the collective narrative that Italian Americans recount today as part of their Columbus origin tale. Fascism also plays a role in this story. Barsotti's heir, Generoso Pope, was an ardent defender and benefactor of Mussolini, leading a wreath-laying ceremony at New York City's Columbus Circle Monument during the 1930s on Columbus Day, along with thousands of ardent fascist supporters. Fascism's taint is an inconvenient historical fact that doesn't fit squarely within contemporary Italian-American rememoration. After World War II, Italian Americans used Columbus as a way to shape group identity across accepted notions of American ideals at a time when their relationship to dominant white culture remained provisional. And in fact, during the 1950s, there was a steady installation of Com Columbus statues across the country. Many of those that came down in the last few months went up in the 1950s, including importantly, those in San Francisco and in Miami which were both paid for by both Italian and Italian American funds and designed and sculpted by former fascist sculptor and Mussolini bodyguard, Vittorio Di Colpertaldo. In the 1970s, in the midst of the white ethnic revival movement, Italian Americans again took to funding Columbus statues as they did as well in the years leading up to the 1992 quincentenary. These initiatives increasingly became part of a convergence of international, national, and local players who collaborated in the creation of such commemorative spaces. Beyond statues, Italian Americans' relationship to Columbus became further codified through lobbying efforts by mostly Italian Americans, which succeeded in 1968 in making Columbus Day an official federal holiday. By the 1970s, then Columbus became unambiguously associated with American patriotism and a hyphenated white ethnic pride, even though the holiday has never been officially named as a day for Italian Americans. The public protest against Columbus in the name of indigenous people's rights also developed during the 1970s and came to the surface in the years leading up to the 1992 quincentenary. Native Americans led the creation of a counter memory one that deconstructed Columbus's symbolic power, and thus for some, the acquired power of Italian Americans. In time, an anti-colonial perspective developed beyond indigenous activism. Contemporary proponents of Columbus employ a range of rhetorical strategies and continue to prioritize an Italian American emotional and ethnic identity to the Genovese navigator. For instance, New York City State and Governor Andrew Cuomo who in 2018 supported listing the Columbus Circle Monument on New York State and National Registries of Historical Places, suggests that Columbus can be remembered apart from his actions, as he did here with his statement in 2020. Other Italian Americans argue that an attack on the physical representation of Columbus is an attack on, on all Italian Americans as a group. Angelo Vivolo, president of the Columbus Heritage Coalition, a national organization created to protect Columbus Day and Columbus Monuments, wrote, quote, that the willful defilement of Columbus statues around the country are acts of hate against more than 17 million Italian Americans, end quote. 
charges of revisionist history have repeatedly been leveled at those seeking to remove the monuments. And yet the early Prominenti's agenda in embracing Columbus as an ethnic icon was specifically intended to rewrite history by suggesting that Italians vis-a-vis -vis Columbus had been in the United States well before the Mayflower. In the last six months, the debates have escalated in city after city. In Philadelphia, for instance, in June, groups of white men and women rallied to protect the local Columbus statue by displaying Italian and US flags. Many came armed with baseball bats, hammers, and rifles. One neighborhood defender, Carmen Marchetti, noted, quote, everybody thinks it's about the statue. It's not. White people are tired of feeling bad or like they've done something wrong, end quote. The actions of the monument protectors suggest that swelling opposition to Columbus threatens those Italian ethnic identities bound to the privileges of whiteness. Meanwhile, Italian Americans who oppose Columbus have long witnessed the co-optation of Italian American identity by conservative, sometimes racist defenders of Columbus. Their anti-Columbus perspectives and initiatives are part of a longer history of political work by those Italian Americans who have repeatedly positioned themselves as allies of people of color, the LGBTQ plus community, immigrants and refugees, working class whites, and other marginalized individuals and groups. Since the 1990s, Italian American progressives have urged that Columbus be abandoned. New York City based Italian Americans for a multicultural United States and San Francisco's annual Dump Columbus Embrace Humanity event are among those which have explicitly helped lay the foundation for Italian American praxis in 2020. Italian American activists who oppose Columbus today are vocal, visible, and articulate a mindfulness of the emotional impact Columbus has for many Italian Americans. For example, Frank Carano wrote with respect to the Columbus statue in New Haven, a perspective that articulates this position well. To kind of quickly sort of bring all the pieces together a little bit and wrap up, the experiences of Italian Americans are much deeper and more nuanced than only that which can be understood through Columbus. Various commemorative sites across the United States continue to more quietly and without much controversy represent the histories and experiences of Italian Americans, including works in honor of athletes, inventors, and the anonymous immigrant. The memorial heritage, to use Nora's term, of Italian Americans also functions with, within these sites and other still to be developed public spaces. Such alternatives remind us of the need to be ever attentive to the constantly recalibrated voices of Italian Americans, voices that are not always easy to hear from the rigid stance of bronze or marble. Thank you. Thank you both for those uh, uh, wonderful presentations. Our uh, final presenter today is Dr. Alejandro Baer, Associate Professor of Sociology and the Director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Minnesota. His current research interests cover transitional justice and memory politics after mass violence, the cultural processing of col uh, colonial genocides, and contemporary antisemitism, with particular focus on Spain and the Spanish-speaking world. His publications including the book, uh, include the books Holocausto, Recuerdo y Representación from 2006 and Memory and Forgetting in the Post-Holocaust Era, The Ethics of Never Again, which was co-authored with Natan uh, Snyder in 2017. Thank you, Dr. Bayer. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine and uh, everyone for for attending. Uh, let me start uh, by saying that as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which resides on Dakota land, um, I point to the importance of reflecting on our institution's colonial history, extractive academic practices, and, and the prolonged absence of, of indigenous voices. And um, I would uh, like to address the question of what does Columbus and October 12th represent in today's Spain. Uh, today was a national holiday in Spain, the Fiesta Nacional, not just any national holiday, the most important national holiday, uh, which is usually celebrated with a gigantic military parade in Madrid. This year was a more modest ceremony uh, at the Royal Palace compound due to the pandemic's constraints. Uh, 
But uh, October 12th and the figure of Christopher Columbus didn't become uh, Spanish symbols until the 20th century. It's worth remembering that Columbus returned to Spain arrested and in chains and he died in disgrace. Columbus enters Spanish collective memory and history politics in good with the longing for its imperial past. The explorer became a Spanish symbol in the wake of the so-called disaster, disaster of 1898 when Spain lost its last overseas colonies in the Spanish-American War, Cuba and the Philippines. Uh, so the territories were lost, but Columbus on October 12th started to represent Hispanidad, Hispanity or Spanishness, a sort of con uh, a continuation of a spiritual community of religion and language between Spain and Spanish America. And it's uh, in the first decades of the 20th century that statues and effigies were erected in honor of Columbus across the country. Streets and squares were named uh, after um, the explorer. And in 1918, October 12th would become a national holiday, the Dia de la Raza, the day of the race, which the race here uh, means a, a new cultural identity, which was understood at the time as a product of the encounter or fusion between uh, the indigenous peoples of America and the Spaniards. So Columbus Day celebrations and Columbus status at that time became an instrument of Spanish foreign policy uh, that attempted to contain the US influence over the region and as it was seen at the time to protect Spanish America from the threat of absorption. Uh, the idea of Hispanidad, of Hispanity, was very prevalent in the Spanish intelligentsia in the early 20th century. Liberals embraced Hispanidad, seeing the former colonies as setting a sort of a youthful example for Spain, democracy versus monarchy. But conservatives ended, the conservatives ended up assuming a virtual monopoly of the Hispanidad sentiment. They stressed very different bonds linking Spain with Spanish America, militant Catholicism, and a strong sense of social hierarchy. In the 1930s, the Spanish imperial myth was taken up with enthusiasm by the right amid intensifying conflict. The Spanish Civil War, 36-39, was a conflict that was fought along three main fault lines, the social economic question, the religious question, the role of the Catholic Church, and the territorial one, centralism versus regional autonomy. And the latter two are linked to the foundational myth of 1492, since uh, this is not only the year of the landing of Columbus in the Antilles, uh, it's also the year of the conquest of Granada, and the fall of the last Islamic ruler on the Iberian Peninsula. And it's also the year the Jews were expelled from the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. And uh, so it's a year in which the Catholic monarchs achieved territorial and religious unification of the peninsula. Hispanidad, in this regard, becomes a very important ideological pillar of the nationalist uh, Francoist camps during the Civil War and the 40 year dictatorship. And I'd like to share my screen to show you um, this image. This image here, which, um, which shows the symbolism of Hispanidad. It's on the left side, it is, it's a poster from the Civil War, uh, Spain, the spiritual orienter of the world. And on the right, it's a front page of the 1947, uh, October 12th, um, newspaper, ABC. Uh, so evangelization, the Lady of the Pillar, which is also celebrated on October 12th, it coincides with that day, territorial unity, brotherhood between Spain and the Americas. So um, not, uh, not surprisingly, uh, there was very little sympathy for the American Columbus Day at the time that was seen as a deplorable appropriation of the figure of Christopher Columbus. Uh, the New York correspondent of the uh, Daily ABC, which is the main, new, was the main newspaper at the time, a newspaper of the regime, uh, wrote uh, a column uh, about the, the Columbus of Brooklyn, that was the title, and he wrote that the Columbus Day is an Italian day in New York, absolutely Italian. 
I'm quoting, Columbus cradle nullifies and makes all other circumstances disappear. Uh, it appears as if Columbus arrived in the Antilles alone and swimming from a beach in Genoa. The name of Spain hardly comes out and none of the Spaniards who were part of the discovery stand out in this celebration. So this is the discourse uh, during the dictatorship. What would change uh, in democracy? Uh, a parliamentary monarchy emerged out of the dictatorship in 1978 and uh, this um, new uh, regime, the new democracy had to seek it, its own festive commemoration. For a few years, the left defended that December 6th, the day the constitution, the new constitution was proclaimed, uh, would be an occasion to celebrate a, the political society founded on democratic values. But the conservatives preferred October 12th, who stood for an ancient and glorious nation that had not emerged just out of the transition to democracy, but that uh, had a uh, a long and um, important history. Uh, there, was a, there was consensus finally on October 12th, and it was paradoxically, paradoxically the socialist majority in 1987, which decided that the Spanish national holiday would fall on the day of the Columbus landing. Uh, however, it gives up its denomination as Dia de la Hispanidad. Uh, now it's only Fiesta Nacional, so somehow uh, removing the, the imperial undertones. It's also connected this decision to the quincentennial celebrations, which were only five years apart, 1992. At that time, Spain faces criticism from Latin, Amer Latin America, um, Latin American countries for staging a giant praise to the disappeared Spanish imperialism. And uh, Spain is challenged uh, from outside to incorporate into the anniversary events alternative narratives. And the new concepts entered the field of discourse at the time. For instance, the Mexican government introduced the concept of the encuentro de culturas, the encounter of the two worlds, or uh, the Cubans who talked about the encontronazo, the collision of worlds. Um, what's important for 1992 is that uh, it opens an opportunity for important debates uh, in the media about historical responsibility, the need for Spain to revisit the imperial narrative and that of Hispanidad, also uh, where it wanted to continue with that role of the Madre Patria, the motherland, that tainted perspective. However, um, these debates, there was also important scholarly discussion at that time, these debates didn't last very long. I would say that this window of opportunity was to a great extent lost, and the year 2000 marks a turning point, which is important. Uh, the year 2000 is the first time the country has a conservative majority rule with the People's Party, which is a party that was founded by a minister of the Franco regime, and uh, this opens a, a new political scenario that led to a strong politis polarization expressed in the cultural wars of the decade, the main points of contention was the debate over Francoisms, unacknowledged and unredressed victims, the role of the Catholic Church, and the question of territorial unity. As you can see, it ties back again to debates on the civil war or uh, related to the memory of that civil war. And these two, the two camps would relate in very different ways to 1492 and to Columbus. The conservatives start to promote at this time, an unprecedented nationalist revival. I'll share my screen again to show you this image here. This uh, giant Spanish flag placed by the government in, in Plaza Colón, in Columbus Square in Madrid, embodies a change, this change of history politics by the conservative. Conservatives, it's, it's okay to be proud of our national history, they would say, our flag, our heritage, our tradition, without feelings of shame or guilt. Uh, somos una gran nación, we are a great nation, is a, uh, a phrase uh, repeated by the Prime Minister at the time. And uh, part of that narrative of greatness is a role Spain played in the Americas exploration, discovery, discovery, exploration, colonization, evangelization. Today, the conservative camp in Spain is, is um, 
fragmented in three parties, the People's Party, Ciudadanos, which is more center-right, and the far-right box who gained uh, important presence in the, in the parliament in the last elections, all embraced that narrative enthusiastically. And this became particularly evident in the reactions to the Colombo statue removals, and also in reaction to the petition from um, demand from Mexican President López Obrador in 2018, that Spain should recognize the abuses perpetrated against indigenous peoples of the Americas um, and issue an apology. So Pablo Casado, the leader of the People's Party, uh, said in response to that, not only do we not apologize, but we vindicate the Hispanidad that transformed the world. Similarly, Vox, the far right party, would say that they don't accept defamations, and that Mexicans and all of America should be grateful to us for bringing civilization that put an end to the reign of terror and barbarism to which they were subdued. And I, I I'm, uh, would like to refer maybe later in the Q&A to this kind of trope that uh, is repeated uh, often in these in this kind of statement. So the parties uh, on these conservative parties also demanded a formal complaint from the Spanish government, which is a socialist government at that time, in regard to the removal of the Columbus uh, statue in Los Angeles. And um, at that time, it's also interesting to read um, headlines in the conservative newspapers, such as historians react to the anti-Hispanic offensive. Anti-Hispanic offensive, it's, 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 an, it's ironical given that the removal is not really very much about Spain. No, that's not much discussion here in the US. But also in Spain, there's neither a genuine concern about what is going on in, in the US urban spaces in regard to Columbus statues. It's very much tied to the internal politics, to the internal identity conflict. And um, more recently, the October 12th celebrations have become opportunities to promote uh, nationalist mobilization, Spanish nationalist mobilization against Catalan separatism. And um, Plaza Colón, uh, which is this square where you see the giant flag. Uh, sorry, I also wanted to show you this because you know, that, that kind of reactions from the conservatives, sort of new um, embracement of Hispanidad by, by, by the conservatives has been mocked uh, repeatedly um, with memes like this, no, that were circulated broadly, where you see the PP Popular Party, uh, no, that, on that, uh, that's the emblem on that flag carried by Columbus. So um, I wanted to show again Plaza Colón, Columbus Square, Madrid, and this is uh, um, um, a giant rally at Plaza Colón being taken by the right and the far right. Um, as my colleague from Universidad Complutense wrote in an article in El País today, um, very uh, appropriately, he wrote that the Catalan independence process reinforced uh, a Spanish nationalism that wrapped itself in constitutional flags, but at the same time claimed, with the support of a legion of essayists, the greatness, the greatness of Spain in the New World. So uh, this, this legion of essayists um, is a mention to a new cultural politics of this, this colonial or imperial nostalgia. And the fact that there are numerous incredibly successful book publications that celebrate uh, the Spain's role in, in the Americas and refute the black legend with another legend, with you know, the so-called white legend or the rosy legend. Uh, I'd like to maybe tell a little bit more later about that. So what's important to emphasize here is that it doesn't really leave these, these, um, uh, these kind of discourses do not leave any room for a more complex, more critical, more reflexive approach uh, to the past. And um, in conclusion, the revival of Hispanidad, and actually the most conservative, most reactionary version of Hispanidad in the, in the 21st century, uh, in addition to other elements of um, Spanish myth-making or history, elements of Spanish history, provides certainties at the time of polarization when there is a lack of shared signs and symbols of national identity. 
it's very much connected to the unfulfilled promises of like, transition, the transition to democracy that did not produce new symbols, nor the desired unity around them. So uh, Columbus and October 12 controversies in Spain have become proxy arguments for internal political fights, but at the same time they touch on a sore spot. We might even say that it's a sort of a Gordian knot of Spain's chronic identity crisis. But um, to end, it's also important to, to, um, to point out the parallelisms with other developments in Europe, where right-wing populist movements re-wrap uh, against what they see as, as a stigma of damaged or weak identities and um, respond with uh, affirmative self-congratulatory narratives of the nation. And of course, none of this is uh, unfamiliar to what we are experiencing in this country. And uh, anyone who had the chance to read the proclamation of Columbus Day 2020 by uh, the president will uh, will see the, the connections with what I, I, I presented. I will leave it here and I, I turn it over to you again, Catherine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Alejandro, and to all of the panelists for uh, really fantastic presentations. Um, I, we're going to turn it over to um, a Q&A session right now. So um, if you've been listening and you have a question, feel, please feel free to uh, chat a question and I will read questions out loud. Um, we have one already, so I'm going to read that. Uh, and this is for any panelist. So um, whoever sort of wants to take it on, um, please do so. So the question is, can panelists say anything about the specific and displaced discourse around Trumpism via the figure of Columbus? Is it coincidental that the anti-Columbus sentiment is finally gaining traction during these white supremacist times? Um, I'm happy to say something and maybe, I know Alejandro, you just, but you just referenced this this uh same point right um yeah but um i i think there's sort of two for me there's sort of a couple things that that the question makes me think of on the one hand i don't know that any of us here are surprised by what trump's statement was it definitely falls in line with so much of what he's been doing specifically with respect even just about education and memory right his proclamation about um, the 76, 70, 1776 commission that's like in part a counter to the 1619 project and things like that is very much in line with that. Um, and we could talk further about that. I think the other thing though that I'm reminded of is how much the federal government has always, always used something like Columbus Day or other national holidays to support whatever position they want and whatever position they're Kind of working towards. So I am reminded of 1942 when the federal government used Columbus Day as a symbolically to announce Italian Americans no longer being considered enemy aliens um, during the Second World War, while of course Japanese Americans were still um, considered enemy aliens. So that there was a symbolic use of the day to create a particular kind of racialized distinction and and for that matter, international politicking going on at that moment between the US and Italy's um, involvement in the Second World War. So on the one hand, this is very Trump-like, his statement was very Trump-like and not surprising. On the other hand, it's what the, it's what the federal government does, is uses this day to promote its own nationalist policies. Do any of the other panelists, uh, would anyone else like to speak to this question? Um, and again, anyone uh, anyone who's here listening are, are welcome to ask more questions. Um, but before I, I read another question, would anyone else like to respond to that? Sure, I can say a few things. I just, um, I do want to point out that um, Indigenous um, folks have been um, you know, protesting these monuments um, since before Trumpism emerged. Um, we've had a long history. Um, the uh, 
uh, quintessentiary was mentioned, you know, as one particular moment when, you know, um, these monuments really became super controversial again. I know that um, uh, at that particular point in time, Purépechas also toppled a statue of Michoacán of one of the colonizers um, that was more prominent there, one of the ev ev um, uh, evangelical um, Christian colonizers. And um, I think that though in the United States right now, uh, what we've been seeing is, you know, the really the drilling in of MAGA and what's that meant to the nation state here, the Make America Great Again. What that means is that this official history that's being promoted, um, you know, excludes um, people who have, you know, who have been historically left out of, um, of uh, the official history of the, of the United States. It's been, you know, a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terribly white supremacist moment um, that tries to drill in, um, you know, that, that erase and um, that was completely evident, um, yet, you know, with this new, with this new pro proclamation and his insistence on over and over again, um, not just uh, marginalizing American Indian voices. I mean, he said other horrible things before, you know, like he said that we weren't, we're not going to apologize for taming, uh, taming a continent. That was a couple of years ago, you know, a direct Trump quote. Um, so, you know, so it goes to show that divide that he's pushing between um, whose official history is being promoted and whose heritage um, these monuments represent um, and, um, and the folks that are marginal to that heritage, you know, as being um, silenced again um, or not having any sort of political power or voice. Um, and I think that's, that's what, we're, what we are seeing, even though, as I said, indigenous folks, you know, for example, the Junipero Serra statues were controversial be be before um, Trump came into, into power. I mean, this is an old conversation for us. Thank you so much. Um, any other, uh, do Joseph or Alejandro, do either of you want to respond to this? Or? Okay, so um, another question is, are there any cross-Atlantic coalitions for land back or decolonization efforts right now? Well, I would say that, that in, in Spain, particularly since 1992, uh, there's the, um, there has been a, a movement um, and all that was also broadly supported by the new wave of um, Latin American immigrants in Spain, which is Quinto Centenario, nothing, fifth, the fifth anniversary, nothing to celebrate. And there, that, that uh, sparked very interesting uh, coalitions. So I would say that in Spain, it incorporated very much of, uh, of uh, indigenous um, discourse that was really present in, in the Americas. And through um, the start of in, in, uh, immigration in Spain, which was mainly in the 90s, it, ha it has a lot to do with that time where these coalitions and uh, movements and organizations start that to this very day organize events to counter the celebratory uh, narrative of, of October 12th. Did anyone else like to uh, answer that question before I move on to another one? Okay. Um, so this is, uh, I think, a, a, maybe a follow-up to the first question, um, but is the bottom line fear uh, sort of money and reparations? Uh, I think that's referring to um, that first question. <laughs> I think I think that um, that does underlie it, as we've seen, for example, just speaking in the United States, um, the uh, political traction and um, power that for in American Indians, you know, have had since the last election with, um, you know, electeds reaching the national stage, whereas that wasn't, you know, a possibility before. Um, now reparations are part of the national conversation as they relate not only to um, tribes and, and indigenous nations, but also to, for example, African Americans. So. That might be, I think, part of it, but as I was saying, um, this is a conversation that has been present um, here. I know that very well as you know, a scholar of ethnic studies. Um, now it's just more out, you know, in the in the public um, discourse and public conversations. But um, but you know, um, this uh, this political divide, he's just wedging. Um, um, President Trump is just wedging it more now than ever to try to rile up rile up the base. <laughs> 
Um, and I, you know, I think that maybe reparations or, you know, a material, material, um, material reparations are, are part of that. But I think more than anything else, it's just, you know, him, um, you know, and, and his, um, his supporters um, doing what they do best, which is just to try to silence as much as possible uh, folks who want to promote diversity and, and, um, and justice. Uh, so we have um, another question. Uh, in Italy, October 12th is Giornato Nazionale di, di Sisi, not, not a national holiday. What are the interactions between um, IMUS, I'm not how sure how to pronounce these, uh, Pitch and other progressive multicultural Italian-American organizations and the Italian government? So um, a number of these organizations, IMIS and PITCH, that we uh, featured in the presentation um, were, are entities that don't exist formally anymore and that they um, had to some degree as formal organizations um, a, uh, a relatively short um, existence, though the enterprise or the individuals involved in these organizations continue to be actis, active in a number of reform, reform um, um, groups. And um, especially here in 2020, we, and uh, we see them in like um, on social media, very active. Um, so the individuals in a number, and I could, I could speak just for IMIS, maybe Lauda could speak to Pitch um, and some of the others on the West Coast. Um, IMIS um, uh, uh, had the individuals in them, I was a member of IMIS for a while, had um, relationships with various progressive entities and, and individuals in Italy, but not with the Italian government per se. Um, and those, those conversations have continued now on social media. So um, uh, there's an, an organization called um, Italians of the Left in the Diaspora that is on Facebook. There is um, even a, um, an organization on Instagram called um, Italian Canadians for Black Lives Matter. And um, a lot of these, um, a lot of these, the individuals involved in those um, um, various groupings are having co co um, conversations across um, national boundaries. There are not any formal um, um, relationships, nor are these organizations really um, sort of formal in that they get together on a regular basis, um, have a, 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 um, a written statement, although some of them, some may have those. They're um, a much more kind of deterritorialized kind of uh, coalitions of groups of Italian Americans, Italian Canadians, and some others who are speaking um, out um, against Columbus and for other fo forms of social justice. Laura, did you wanna add anything to that or is that fine? Okay, uh, so um, another sort of general question that I think uh, probably anyone could answer uh, was, how would you say COVID has promoted the narrative around reparation and addressing the counter narrative of Columbus as hero? I don't know if COVID has promoted. I, I, I don't think I, I, I would agree with that, that uh, COVID has promoted narrative around reparation. I think COVID has caused all sorts of, of issues and uh, sparked many debates, but um, I don't, I don't, maybe my, my colleagues have something to say about that. I think that um, the um, COVID um, has brought to light more of the inequalities in the United States, you know, that we already saw were there. Um, with the pandemic, we've seen, you know, um, for example, just drastic, um, drastically bad impacts in, in um, indigenous communities like the Navajo Nation, as well as, um, um, you know, Latinos in the United States and, and Black folks in the United States. I mean, those, quali those, those inequalities have been, 
brought to brought to light. I think um, in our generation, you know, just people who are alive today, these generations haven't seen those really bear the way that they are today, um, with lack of access, you know, to healthcare, um, lack of access to, um, you know, to equal um, opportunity, equal treatment. I mean, we can go, you know, on and on with um, with how that's just um, really laid to bear today. I think the unrest, you know, that happened um, here um, in Minneapolis um, it, in the middle of the, it, it was accentuated by, by the pandemic um, because, uh, I mean, I think that all of us are, are just right now, everybody is tired, you know, and um, as, as somebody, you know, who's um, positioned at, at, a, at, you know, at simultaneous, you know, marginal identities here in the United yeah. States. The, those, um, those, the, you know, having to constantly worry about our communities and how they're being impacted by the pandemic and don't have access to the resources that they need in order to sur to survive them. I would say that that, you know, that does come into um, into conversation with um, with addressing, you know, addressing these um, inequalities on the national on the national stage. And, and I do feel like you know, part of that, part of that, part of that unrest is that it was accelerated with the, with witnessing nationally what happened to George Floyd. Um, you know, it, it was also, it was also, you know, just everything that we've seen with the, with the pandemic, these inequalities and the way that they're laid bare, that they're laid, they're laid, they are laid bare for, for us. So um, it doesn't surprise me that um, in these times of COVID and these times of the pandemic, you know, we also, we also had, saw a revolution start, you know, nationally and I don't think it's, it's it's not going to be the end of it I think that there's going to be there's going to be more thank you um uh we have another question um and then I think Alejandro there's a there's I think there's a question in, in Spanish that's directed towards yours um but my Spanish isn't quite good enough to read it out loud but I'm going to read this one that's in English um uh, I'm wondering about the position of the Catholic Church regarding Columbus, as well as the role Columbus and Catholicism, e.g. sainthood, um, in the discourse around Columbus in the U.S. and Spain today. The role uh, Columbus and Catholicism played, I guess, in the discourse around Columbus in the U.S. and Spain today. Um, to uh, re reiterate um, um, my our comments earlier, um, Columbus was this really important um, um, figure for uh, Catholic immigrants, Irish in particular, as well as Italians later on, and continues to be raised um, as a um, sort of um, a, um, a, a someone who brought Catholicism as well as Western civilization, quote unquote, um, to the United States. It's, uh, this is an interesting uh, question given today's events here in New York City in which um, um, Governor Cuomo, uh, who made a promise a year ago and uh, um, made it known to um, people today that he made good on that promise, which was to erect a statue on Columbus Day to St. Mother Cabrini and to uh, sort of uh, tie those two figures together in this very highly symbolic um, act. and. Um, to um, which which was done today, and it's kind of an interesting to see that Mother Cabrini often gets raised as one of a number of possible alternative Italian American figures who can be um, promoted instead of Columbus. Um, here they are today in this um, in this new monument that has been erected, being uh, coupled together um, in. Um, in a kind of um, a, a strange and interesting fashion. Yeah, on, on the role of the Catholic Church in these debates in Spain, uh, well, since, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the question of, I mean, Hispanidad is based on this, on this, on this idea of, a, of a religious and language unity between Spain and Spanish America. So uh, Catholicism plays an important role. And the Catholic uh, Church as institution has, has very much embraced that, uh, that uh, obviously that, that discourse. But at this point, I mean also, you, but, but I would, the interesting part here, I would say is that in, since in the Catholic Church, you have, very, you have different currents. There is also a, a critical current that uh, understands that the country should uh, try to 
regain the, the capacity of, of criticism and, and self-criticism that was shown early on by, by the School of Valladolid, by Montesinos, by Las Casas. Um, and uh, this is interesting, so it's not, it's not only a matter between Catholics and anti-Catholics, since in, in Spain the, that religious question on the, on the anti-clericalism is still very vivid to this day, since the time of the, of, of the Civil War. But it's also interesting to see that within the Catholic Church you have positions that do not replicate automatically that, uh, that um, the, 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 the rosy legend, no? the, the attack on the black legend, that doesn't, as I said, leave any space for, for self-criticism, and that vindicate the capacity for self-criticism, but by pointing to some of these uh, important figures in the Catholic Church that raised uh, early on the issues of, of, of uh, indigenous mistreatment and genocide. Great, thank you. Um, Alejandro, did you want to say anything um, more about the, the, the other question that's in the chat? Or, um... So this is, a, this is about an event that took place um, maybe about five or, or, or eight years ago when the king asked the Venezuelan uh, president of the time, Hugo Chavez, to, to shut up because it, um, it, it was very um, well, you remember Chavez was a person that uh, spoke uh, what was on his mind without much of a filter. And at that time, he um, he said very demeaning words about Spain and Spain's role. And the king, the king uh, uh, said, "Por qué no te callas? Why don't you shut up?" So he's asking whether the, the, the Spanish kings still have that. Uh, this uh, Salvatore is asking whether the Spanish kings still have that say and that influence over uh, in, in Latin America today. Um, I would say probably not, since the Spanish uh, monarchy in general uh, is very much under scrutiny uh, in Spain itself, and I would think it has such a sway in, uh, in Latin America as it might have had in the past, but many centuries ago. Okay, we're, um, we're uh, coming to sort of the end of the time. We have two more questions uh, listed in the chat. So I'm, I'm going to read both of those um, and then uh, we can sort of use them as the, as the end of our discussion. Um, the first one is, I hear from the presentations tonight and my readings on immigration that there is a hierarchy of victimization in the U.S. The 1924 law excluded all immigrants of Southern and Eastern European origin. Uh, white people have also been victims of violence and exclusion. How do you respond to the hierarchy of victimization? How should we think of it is the first question. And the second one is how would Spain deal with atoning with the genocidal violence inflicted on the continent that we have named after another Italian? Are there pragmatic ideas of improving the relationship between Spain, Europe and the colonized countries? Steps like a real equitable economic exchange and development effort um, that is more than just creating a market opening and softening political relations like many aid programs um, are in practice. So two very big questions. Um, I don't know uh, if someone wants to take one of those on first. I would say that you know, it's, it's, it's an excellent reflection and uh, the kind of question that is, it's a, it's a comment. So I. Um, I, I, I mean, I have not much to say uh, about uh, that. Um, of course, there are, there are different positions regarding Spain's role in Latin America. There's, very, there's a lot of criticism as a sort of neo-imperialist uh, Spain through multinationals like, like uh, Repsol, like the oil companies and Telefonica. So I would say that the pragmatic ideas are in terms of, well, what does that mean in terms of a new relationship between Spain and and its former colonies. And um, yeah, I, I would leave it there. It's a, it's a big topic. And um, on, the, on the first question around the hierarchies of, uh, I, think, I think the question said victimization. Um, and I think it, it would require a course on US history, Marxism, and uh, the kind of construction of whiteness to really you know, answer the question properly. But um, I think that it, it point rather than a hierarchy, I see it as this constant fluctuation and it really points to the construction of race and at the same time the privileged position, the continual pri privileged position of this imagined, of imagined and real sense of whiteness. 
and um, a very clear role that class and institutional structures of racism and class can have in the entire foundation of the United States and many other countries in the world and um, not easily undone or not easily rethought. And in fact, part of why we're all you know, here having this conversation about trying to um, push our, our even our own ideas about it and our and our own kind of practices around it into new places. Yeah, I would add um, uh, White by Law by Ian Haney Lopez as a resource to answer that particular question for, um, for the person who asked it, um, because I'm not sure if I would call it a hierarchy of victimization, um, since the, um, the uh, although there was, you know, an, an, there were exclusionary acts that also impacted um, Southern and Eastern European immigrants, um, the construction of, of whiteness, um, you know, has been one that has been backed by policy historically under the law as well. And, uh, and in that book, White by Law, Haney Lopez really goes into detail to um, analyze the natural, naturalization cases and the way that they continuously upheld whiteness, um, the attachment and the relationship between whiteness and, and American citizenship. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, we had a fabulous pre a a presentation today on um, Italian American heritage, for example, and the way that, um, you know, part of um, the defending of, of these Columbus statues is precisely because it has allowed um, Italian Americans to have claim to that whiteness that, you know, was denied to them, um, you know, before. Um, not to downplay, you know, the, um, the uh, horrible way that, for example, Irish Americans, Italian Americans were treated, um, you know, um, because they were not the same as as, as um, you know, the, the, those of British descent that were here before them um, when they first, um, you know, got to the United States, the first generations. Um, but, but I do think that, um, you know, um, as uh, Laura was saying, uh, it's important to understand how there are multiple, um, multiple um, factors that um, contributed um, and uh, factors of privilege that have contributed to upholding whiteness as a construct that has completely been attached to American citizenship. If I may, just um, these comments, I agree with all the comments here um, are really insightful. Um, I, I, I just want to note that the notion of a hierarchy of, um, of victimization, I just kind of find kind of troubling to just think of um, various acts of violence against um, different groups as sort of one above the other, one less than the other, um, just kind of troubling in general. But I do, do think the point of things like the 1924 law and some of the other um, aspects that are raised to here is, is, is to note the history, um, American history has not always been a welcoming place to, um, to immigrants. There has been always um, um, from um, from its uh, very origins, uh, one based on uh, xenophobia um, and um, violence against uh, people who are not the dominant group, the white and, and in case of uh, Southern Europeans and the, the Anglo-Saxons. Um, but the, and the, in addition that the um, United States has always also been um, anti-worker and has fought um, various aspects of working class culture, working class acts, of unity to um, struggle against various f types of oppression. And I think here today we're talking about um, the ways in which the United States has um, created acts of violence against um, people of color, um, against workers, against immigrants, and uh, seeing those struggles um, as interrelated, not as um, uh, viewed in hierarchies or in separate acts, but as ones that are, um, should, that are ones that are, um, are united and unite us in um, working towards um, a better country. Uh, thank you uh, to all of the presenters. Those were um, really wonderful answers to those questions. Um, we're basically out of time. So I'm just going to say uh, thank you all once again for the presentations that you gave today. I think that this was um, an actually uh, very important and insightful uh, reflection on um, the research and insight into uh, today, Indigenous Peoples Day, and into um, this person, uh, Christopher Columbus, and what he has come to mean um, to so many different people. So thank you all, and uh, I wish everyone a good evening.
Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Everyone. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. So much. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.